Hey everyone, this is About Metrics, and this is part four of my mini series on audio editing in Bitwig 3.2. Uh, in this episode, I'm going to talk specifically about stretching and warping. Warping is what it's called in Ableton Live. A lot of people in Bitwig come from Ableton, so stretching, warping. Um, I'm going to talk about some tips and tricks and gotchas about stretching that will confuse you, especially if you're coming from Ableton or any other DAW. Uh, I'm also going to talk about a workaround for doing Ableton-style transposing of clips. And by that, I mean this is a really, really common uh, parameter that people in Ableton use all the time, especially for things like bringing in a kick drum that's tuned to the wrong semitone and you need to transpose it up or down. And then you're going to duplicate that kick drum all over your audio track and set up your kick patterns. Uh, this transpose knob is just used constantly. And unfortunately, there's nothing quite like this in Bitwig at all, but there is a way to do this. And it's actually not that bad. And it after I talk about stretching in general, I will talk about the specific use case and how to do this very quickly and very easily. Okay, but it's not obvious at all how to do this in Bitwig. All right, so <clears throat> let's start with some basics about stretching. Oh, and if you haven't seen the earlier videos in this mini series, you really need to go back and watch at least part one, although I recommend you watch all of them because part one talks about a lot of big picture stuff and terminology and concepts that I'm just gonna completely ignore and go right past. And we're just gonna jump straight into stretching in this video. So if you really wanna understand everything I'm doing, go check out at least video one. Um, you should find a link to it in the description below. So stretching, stretching, stretching. It's gonna be one of the things that confuse you at first. It's pretty easy to wrap your head around it. Once you wrap your head around it, you'll never worry about it again. But at first, especially if you're coming from Ableton, some of your muscle memory and concepts won't quite apply directly to Bitwig, although they do share a lot of overlap. Uh, there are a lot of similarities. So let's talk about it from scratch. I'm going to get rid of this drum loop and bring it in again from scratch. This drum loop is at 125 BPM. Just something vanilla that won't annoy us to hear over and over. My project tempo is at 110 BPM, so clearly if I'm going to make this thing fit my, my grid and, and have the beats fall where they need to, I'm going to need to um, warp it or stretch it in Bitwig terminology. So you can see these transients, like that one's not on the grid, that one is, but that one's not, and so on. So how do we get this lined up with the grid? It's also probably a two bar loop and you can see it's falling short of a full two bars right here. So the first thing to know, the first gotcha is by default, Bitwig tries to be really helpful. And if you first install Bitwig and load it up and look in the settings behavior tab, there's this thing called default stretch mode. And I think by default, Bitwig wants to set this like so where long samples come in stretched and short samples come in raw, or maybe they're both stretched, or maybe it's the other way around and long sample is raw and short sample is stretched. But what this is doing in general is Bitwig trying to be helpful because it knows you have all these sample libraries and it knows you, you know, they're often at a different tempo than your project. So what they want to do is be helpful and say, well, if you drag in a sample, it can understand it wants to automatically stretch it out. Now we can see it's a perfect two bar sample. We can see that um, the transients are lining up right on the grid and now the problem is this, is that the, what stretch, how did it stretch it? What did it decide to do? It did some kind of stretching. Well, if we look at the audio event and the properties for the audio event, you can see down here is the stretching section. So we can see that Bitwig very helpfully brought it in in a stretch mode called stretch, which is a granular stretching mode. It's one of their older original ones. We can also see that it's neutral at the original pitch tempo, but it has clearly changed it, right? The original is at 125. 
our project's at 110, so it's clearly changed it. It's no longer non-neutral. But it's used a granular stretching technique. And is it the best stretching technique? Will it sound the best? I don't know, let's see. All right, let's try a different stretching mode. Let's go for my favorite, which is Elastic Pro. Okay, in this case, sounds about the same. Uh, we could pick another mode like uh, cyclic. Okay, now there we're starting to hear artifacts. Because <laughs> cyclic is a wavetable style, uh, it, like uses frames. So there's lots of different stretching modes. Some of them are gonna sound better than others. Stretch isn't bad, but there's a stretch, there's a high definition stretch, there's these other modes. Elastic Pro, which one do you use? Which one's the best? And generally speaking, I don't like it when a DAW automatically stretches things for me. So this, this is coming down to personal preference, but I think there's some value in always being able to hear what it sounded like and see what it looks like at its original raw tempo. And then based on that, I can decide how I want to stretch it and I can handle the stretching myself. So your mileage may vary here, but I'm going to recommend you always set long samples and short samples to come in as raw. And I really wish I could set records and bounces to come in as raw too, but it's not an option. And it's not an option because in one respect, you don't really need it. You may want to like bounce something uh, or resample something or record something and then immediately stretch it a little bit. And so they're trying to be helpful by, by saying, look, if you bounce a thing or record a thing, you're bouncing it at the current project tempo. So the thing you're laying down on the track is already at the perfect project tempo. We don't need to apply any stretching to it, but we're going to, so we're going to use the stretch mode. We're going to use the one stretch mode that is neutral at the original pitch and tempo. So a bounce and record is always done at the original pitch and tempo of the project itself. So even though it is by default in stretch mode, and not raw, it's still completely neutral. Unlike if you were to choose this option that says on record bounce, pick some other stretch mode, like on, on record bounce, always set it into Elastic Pro stretch mode. If you do that, your bounce or your recording is no longer neutral because just putting a stretch mode on something will change its characteristics to prepare it for being stretched, right? It's literally gonna change the sound. The only one in the entire set of stretching algorithms that's neutral, if the tempo hasn't actually changed, is stretch. So that's why this is the default for records and bounces because you can just ignore it if you're not gonna stretch it. And if you are gonna stretch a bounce, well, great, it's already in a stretch mode and you can just drag it around and see what it sounds like. And then maybe you could decide to pick a different stretch mode than the default one that's called stretch, a granular stretching mode. Okay, so a little bit of a, a diatribe about this. I really recommend you bring them in raw so you can always know what it sounded like originally when you drag it in from your sample library. But there's a, there's, this can bring in some gotchas, because here's the thing. You notice when I dragged it in and told Bitwig to helpfully stretch long samples for me? Well, it said, I know what BPM it's at originally. I'm gonna bring it in at that BPM. I'm gonna stretch it out, make it exactly two bars. And there you go. Problem is, not every sample has the right kind of metadata in its title or in the hidden uh, binary metadata inside the file itself. Not every file is going to have the clues that Bitwig needs to understand what its original tempo was. Or the person who made a sample pack may have mistyped the actual BPM. Or, you know, there could be a bunch of things that could affect Bitwig's understanding of what the original raw BPM is, and therefore Bitwig won't be able to stretch it correctly. Let's see if I can find that, an example of that. Yeah, this is a good example. So here's something that's at 140. And if I bring it in, well, actually, first I have to 
come back here and change the setting so that it's trying to be helpful. So sure, go ahead and go ahead and stretch it for me, Bitwig, if I bring it in. So I'm going to take this and drag it in. Now, does it understand that the original tempo was at 140? In this case, it does. So that's cool. But I've had other cases where there isn't. Uh, where did I see it? I've definitely run into some where either there wasn't a BPM specified in the sample name or there was something wrong with it. Yeah, these are all looking pretty good, so I don't think we're going to run into this here. Uh, but there can be cases where it just doesn't really work the way we would expect. Yeah, let's go back up here manually, get back to some of these. All right. Let's just move on and explain what to do when you don't bring it in with this setting on. Okay, so we're setting it back to bring them in as raw. So you, you notice when I drag this erupt AI125 in, it already warped it and snapped it out to its full two bar span, right? If I bring this in again, I'll bring this one in. Okay, you can see this one probably wants to be a full two bars, but it's short because right now this sample is in raw mode or this audio event is in raw mode. So watch what happens when I flip it to a stretch mode. I'm going to use Elastique Pro, which is my favorite, and I'll talk about all these stretching modes in a minute. I'm just showing you a big picture thing right now. As soon as I flip it to a stretch mode, you saw the waveform stretch, but the clip didn't change its start and end points. Let's watch that again. I'm going to control Z, right? It's raw again. Let's flip it to any other stretch mode. The waveform changes. The underlying audio event has changed its speed to be correctly warped, but the clip itself hasn't changed. And this is something that'll confuse a lot of people. And I, I see questions about this on the forum all the time. I brought in a sample and I, I don't know, I did things and then I play it and it cuts short. It doesn't play fully out. What's going on with that? It's probably because it, they brought it in raw and then stretched it later. And what was originally that long, right? stays that long in the clip, even though the underlying audio event is now longer. And if I drag the clip out, you'll see that there's the rest of the audio event. And sure enough, the new stretched audio event ends exactly at the end of the second bar. So this is tip number one for you. If you prefer, for various reasons, to always bring in your samples raw, and then you decide, you know what, I need to stretch that sample. So let's pick a different one at a different BPM. These are all like 125, aren't they? Yeah, that's not too annoying. So if you bring it in raw and you stretch it, first thing you have to do is come up here and find the end of the new stretch sample and then drag it back. And it's almost always going to be an even, if it's a good sample pack, it'll be an even, you know, it'll fall right on a grid line and you'll be good to go. So that's gotcha number one. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the stretching modes briefly. I'm not going to go into exhaustive detail on every one of these. I'm just going to basically say this. The clean stretching mode is always an elastic something, right? And of these elastic stretching modes, the Pro is always the best. If you're from Ableton, you've learned that Complex Pro is a dirty word, and it sounds terrible on a lot of sample types. And so you've learned to just avoid Complex Pro, except in very specific instances. In Bitwig, it's the other way around. Pro is not a dirty word. Here, this is literally the absolute best, cleanest stretching mode there is, and it works great even on highly transient materials like drums and stuff, okay? If you have the computer horsepower, if you're not doing a whole ton of stretching all throughout your project, uh, always reach for Elastic Pro if your goal is clean stretching, 
with the least amount of artifacts and weird gotchas to the sound, right? Now the creative stretching modes are these ones up here, but let's, let's continue to talk about Elastique for a minute because there's four different Elastique algorithms. Pro is the best and cleanest and most versatile. All these other ones are effectively more economical versions of it. Yes, it's true, Pro uses a little more CPU, but really not much and not nearly as much as Ableton's Complex Pro does. It's nowhere near the resource hog of that algorithm. So it's very economical already. You can use it all over your project if you have a modern computer with you know, an i9 or i7 processor or the AMD equivalent. Um, if you have memory, all that stuff, right? It's, you, you just use Elastic Pro for everything if you want clean stretching, it's the best. If you have an older computer or you struggle or you have a huge project with tons and tons of stretching and lots of other plugins and you're really worried about your CPU meter going up, then yeah, you can experiment with some of these more economical modes, but by and large, just avoid them and use this one. Now, the creative modes, the ones that will add artifacts are typically these granular modes. Uh, they're all gonna sound a little different. I'm not gonna go into them, just experiment with them. One thing you will notice right off the bat is that a very popular mode from Ableton, there's actually two modes from Ableton. There's the transient, or beat mode, I think it's called in Ableton, and then there's also the texture mode. And those are really popular creative modes that do interesting things. There's something in here, I can't remember which one, that's kind of like the transient beat mode or the beat, beat preserving mode or beats or whatever it's called. There's one of these is kind of like that, not exactly like that. You can find it yourself, but I do wanna talk about the, um, the texture mode. I'm gonna open up a new MIDI track and uh, we're gonna open up Bitwig Sampler on that track. And um, there is a mode in the sampler called textures, right there. This is almost identical to Ableton's texture warping mode. Same sound, same properties, same style of, of warping. The problem is it's only inside of the sampler. So you can only use it with things you drag into the sampler. So just be aware of that. Texture mode is in Bitwig. I have made a request myself a couple times saying, hey guys, why don't you just add it to the list of modes over here? Because there's a lot of people who use it coming from Ableton. and uh, it's handy sometimes to use on clips that are in your arranger, but just be aware that if you really want that sound, you do it through the sampler and dragging a sample into the sampler and switching it to textures mode and then slow down the speed. If you slow down the speed, it's exactly like, like if I crank the speed all the way down really close to zero, like 1% or 2%, that's almost identical to dropping a clip into Ableton, setting texture warping mode on it, and then increasing the project tempo to something like 999, right? All you're doing is using a texture warping mode and slowing down the sample from its original speed. And that's exactly what this speed knob does. Now, let me tell you this, the tricks you can play with texture mode in Ableton, you can play to the nth degree inside the sampler because there's all sorts of tricky things you can do besides just slowing it down. You can play with the grain, you can play with the jitter or motion on the grains, you can freeze the playhead and then use modulators over here to like automatically drag the playhead position back and forth along the waveform in a modulated or random way. And all of this is happening with the cool, weird artifacts and sounds you get out of textures mode. It's all right in here, really powerful, but you gotta, you gotta take your brain out of the mindset of where the hell is texture mode? I don't see texture mode. I want to warp this with texture mode. Where's texture mode? Just do it in the sampler and then bounce it out of the sampler into a clip and now you've got it in an audio clip. And you have a lot of flexibility that you don't have in Ableton with textures mode. So that's my clue for that. That's all I'm gonna say about textures mode. Um, 
Okay, so let's talk about, and let me get rid of this for a minute. Let's talk about some basic basics of stretching without getting into too much detail. We've got a drum loop. We put it in a stretch mode. We put it in the cleanest stretch mode, which is Elastic Pro. Okay. And now we want to do stretch stretching on it. So what can we do? How do we do it? What are the gestures? What are, what's the workflow? So first thing to know is you cannot do any stretching up here in the arranger. I know in Ableton you can. In Bitwig you can't. Just get over it. You, you can do stretching easily, just not up here, okay? The only thing you can do to the audio waveform in Bitwig is slide it back and forth, like we've talked about in previous videos, right? You can just put that transient at the start of the clip or put that transient, just put that blip at the start of the clip, whatever, right? You can do that, that's it. That's all you can do up here in the uh, arranger. Where you do your actual stretching is down here in the event editor, okay? Now, stretching always happens inside the audio event. It's where the sample is, right? So it's got nothing to do with clips or this, you know, being in the clip mode. I can't do any kind of stretching when I'm in clip mode. I have to be in event mode or something underneath events. Now, I haven't really talked about this yet, but if you read the Bitwig manual, they talk about audio events having, um, oh, what's the word they call it? Uh, expressions. Okay, expressions usually means MIDI expressions like timbre, I'm sorry, pressure, velocity, things like that. That's what expressions usually means. And so Bitwig kind of translated that idea to audio events, which is basically the container for samples. And they've said the container that holds samples, the audio events, have certain kinds of things that are like MIDI expressions like velocity and pressure and release time and all that stuff, right? And so they call these buttons down here expressions. These are all expressions of an audio event. And some of them are obvious, like the gain of the, of the sample. You can, you can make it have a, like an automation curve and up the gain or down the gain. You can do pan and pan it left or right. Uh, and then in certain stretching modes that support pitch changes by semitone or format changes because the the uh, specific stretching mode has some sort of format control to it, right? If the stretching mode you're using supports formants, then you have this formant expression where you can take the formants independently up or down in semitones, independently of the pitch up or down in semitones. So that's what these four at the bottom are. We're not going to worry about these. These are easy to figure out. Just be aware that pitch and formant won't work unless you are in a stretching mode that has a formant and pitch visible and active and usable. Like if I take this, this loop right now and I kick it up in pitch by um, a couple semitones and we go to the pitch tab and we zoom here, you can see it's gone two semitones up from zero. If I go up another semitone, see it jumps. If I go down 12 semitones, it moves down 12 from wherever it was and so on. And then I could take this line and make, make curves and have the pitch go all up and down across the length of the, uh, the entire clip. All right, let's zoom in on the whole clip here, right? So this is now what's happening with, with the pitch. And again, this is all based on the event and specifically on whether or not the warping mode you're using supports pitch changes, all right? If you aren't warped, let's do this again. Let's control Z a couple times and get rid of all these. All right, if I'm not warped in any way, if I switch my mode back to raw, see how pitch gets grayed out? And even though I can look at this pitch tab, I can't, and I even though I can sort of kind of maybe draw automation on it, right? This automation isn't, it's got nothing to work on because I'm not in a warp mode that supports pitch. Pitch is grayed out here. So this is important to understand. That's one of the places you'll get confused. If I switch, it, I have this automation drawn on here, but it's not actually working. But if I switch to any mode that supports pitch, now all of a sudden it becomes bold and visible and highlighted. And now I can see the pitch is actually doing something because it knows how to, because I'm in a warp mode that supports it. 
All right, let's undo those pitch changes. And the same exact thing is true of formant. I'm in raw mode. Formant is kind of this dull gray. It's kind of grayed out. And even though I could come here and like make changes and draw curves and whatever, nothing's gonna happen unless I come back to the uh, editor settings and switch to some mode that supports formants. If I go to stretch, stretch mode doesn't have formant control. There's no formants, it's still grayed out. If I go to cyclic, now I have formant control because one of the properties of cyclic mode is a formant, right? And same thing for uh, Elastic Pro, gives me formant control, right? So just be aware of that for these expressions here. Um, okay, let's undo all that so we don't hear weirdness <laughs> while we're doing other things. Let's go back to stretching. Onsets, I'm gonna talk about last, because onsets, no, I guess I'll get them out of the way. Onsets and stretching go hand in hand to some degree. Uh, in Ableton, onsets are called transients, and here in Bitwig, these are onset markers. In Ableton, they would be transient markers. I don't know what they would be in other DAWs. But let's, let's get something really clear right up the front. Onsets are not perfect. They are not transient markers. They're a slightly different beast. There's a lot of ways to detect onsets based on spectral characteristics, changes over time, this and that and the other thing. Bitwig uses a type of onset detection that's based on the envelope of the sound. And I don't know, there's not enough information I've ever run across that tells me whether they're using single band envelopes, like broadband for the whole spectrum, or whether they're, they're dividing the sound up into multiple spectrums and looking at envelope changes in each band of the spectrum and deciding which of those envelope changes is the most dramatic and therefore deciding to place an onset marker at that point or not. I don't know if it's multi-band or single band, but I do know that they're basically using amplitude changes or the envelope shape of the signal to figure out where onsets are occurring. And they try to put onsets where the biggest envelope changes happen. So clearly when you've got a nearly silent waveform and suddenly you start having a big upswing and downswing again, the envelope has suddenly changed. And so they put an onset marker there. But if you look really close, it's never perfect. Like that onset marker is not right here at the zero crossing just before the first big upswing of this transient for this drum hit, right? And likewise, why do we have an onset marker here? What the hell's going on here? This is what makes me think it might be multi-band envelope detection because we notice this waveform over here is really smooth and shiny, but right here is where some high frequency noise starts happening in the upper bands of the spectrum. We, these, these crackly lines mean a sudden high frequency change. And so even though the transients, you know, it's like there's not a real obvious transient there. If anything, it looks like the transients are more like here. This is where the upper frequencies are suddenly changing their envelope quite a bit. Like, this would be almost dead silence in an upper band of a multi-band like EQ or something, but then it suddenly sees these short little waveforms, and so that means suddenly there's an envelope in the upper frequencies. So my point is sometimes you'll see something and you'll go, why the hell did it put an onset marker there? And it's probably just because of their onset detection algorithm. Like, here's another weird one. It looks like it's right in the middle of this big kick or whatever. But again, look at this. A very smooth, subby kick. But right here, there's some crackly, white, noisy thing happening at the end of that kick. It's either layered with the kick or something. But because there's a sudden change in the waveform, up in the high frequencies, we have an onset marker, right? So the onset markers are trying to be helpful. In certain kinds of clips, they'll be more accurate than others, but even when they look accurate, when you're zoomed way out like this, if you zoom in really close, they're not that accurate, right? They're close, and from a listener standpoint, no one's gonna care about this tiny little millisecond or two or three difference, right? But just be aware they're not fully accurate. So for that reason, when you're doing stretching, 
you're often going to want to kind of sort of ignore the onsets, or you're going to need to work around the onsets, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. So that's all I really want to say about onsets. The main thing to know about this onsets mode of track editing is that this is the only place you can actually move the onsets or double click to delete an onset or double click to add an onset. Um, let's zoom in a little bit and maybe line that up again with where it originally was, right? Um, and you can multi-select a bunch of onsets and move all of them at the same time, right? Or you could multi-select a bunch of onsets and just hit your delete key to delete them. Or you could click one onset and do control A to select all of the onsets in the entire clip and just delete them all in one go and then come in and rebuild your own onsets, right? There's all these things you can do with onsets and they're all done up here in this one mode. If you're in audio event mode, you can't create an off onset. You can't delete an onset. Let me create one there come back into audio event mode. I can see it, but I can't move it. I can't select it. Not really, I can't delete it. I can't do anything. I can't add new ones. So you have to be here if you want to add, remove, move, change, do whatever to onsets. Um, and now stretch mode is influenced by the onsets, but it's not, it's kind of also independent of the onsets. And so they give you these two different editing modes instead of one, like in, bit, uh, in Ableton. Onsets and stretch mode are all in the same waveform. And you work with onsets at the top and you work with stretch markers at the bottom and they're kind of independent. You can manipulate both of them as you go without having to change your editing mode. But for whatever reason, it's not like that in Bitwig. So there you go. Um, so let's get this back to having all the onsets in it. I'm just going to undo a bunch of times until I get them all back. That looks about right. OK, so let's talk about stretching now. The main takeaway, the main thing I want you to remember is that there's two different levels at which you want to typically stretch things. One level is stretching the entire waveform, larger or smaller, to fit a span of time, okay? Like, if Bitwig didn't know that this thing was at an original tempo of 125, and so I dragged it in my project, and it says, I have no idea what the original tempo is, so even when you flip it into a stretch mode, I'm going to keep it at its original tempo of 110. And I can look at this waveform, and I can see, well, those hits are not lined up on the grid line. Clearly it's the wrong tempo. Let's pretend that it didn't have BPM information in the clip title, so I have no idea what the original BPM was, right? Typically, what you need to do is then just like drag this tempo around until you start seeing the beats line up. And now you know that's pretty much where the original tempo was. Now notice it's at 125 and these are like exactly on the beat lines. Right? Even the onset markers are sitting right on the beat lines in this case. So, you know, you can just manually drag the tempo and stretch it until it looks right. If you're good at that type of thing, DJs will have an easier time with this because they do it in their DJ software all the time. Um, another clue is like looking at the total clip length, right? I, I'm guessing that's a two bar clip. So I'm just gonna push it out and see what it looks like when it hits exactly two bars. And yep, sure enough, at two bars, all those transients are lining up on the grid. So this must be at an original tempo of 125. So the point is you can do full scale stretching basically by just mucking around with this tempo slider while it's in a stretch mode. Okay, that's one way to do full scale stretching. But now let's say there's a different way. Let's bring it back down to 110. When you are in clip mode, all you can really do is like make the clip longer or shorter. You can't even touch the audio event inside. When you're in audio event mode, you now can like make the internal audio event be truncated, right? Longer, shorter. Um, you can slide the waveform. Well, there's nothing to slide because it's at its full distance, but if I make it shorter, I can slide the waveform back and forth, 
right? You can do all these things when you're in audio event mode. But you can do one more thing. And that one more thing is, see how my cursor changes when I get near the edge? It turns into that little half, looks like a, a barbell, but only half of a barbell, kind of. This is going to allow me to do a full-scale stretch of the waveform. Let's show you what that looks like. It's not going to work if I'm already at the edge of the clip, because it won't go any farther than the clip. It actually will stretch the underlying audio event, and you can see it stretching and shrinking, right? Not truncating, but stretching and shrinking. But it's a little counterintuitive because the edge of the clip container above it is blocking me from like seeing how far I'm actually stretching the audio event. So a tip for working with this mode is to drag your clip marker out far enough that you can actually watch the whole event shrink and expand, right? And so there I can, again, I could do the same kind of thing as directly messing with the tempo over here and dragging it up and down, right? But I can do it in a more visual way by just grabbing the edge of the waveform and dragging it this way. And again, the trick is, as always, is knowing how to, how to see and work with the entire audio event inside of a clip container. And the trick there is just drag this out to give yourself some room to work and then stretch the clip, okay? So that's tip number one, is that you can do this kind of full-scale stretching of the entire clip, even if you're not in the stretch mode, even if you're in audio event mode, even if you're in onsets mode. I can still do it. No, I guess I can't do it in onsets mode because it wants to put an onset there, but at least here and here, you can do that kind of stretching. Now, this is where it gets a little weird. If I'm in stretch mode, and I put my cursor near the edge, it's no longer a single barbell, it's a double barbell. And it's gonna act and behave very differently now if I try to grab this and stretch. Look what's happening. It's no longer stretching the edge of the audio event, it's stretching the sample inside of the audio event container. And even worse, I can only go in one direction. I can only stretch to this side. I can't stretch in this direction. This will be very confusing at first if you run into this. So this is gonna be my first bit of advice to you. This is, this is a big tip. When you wanna stretch the whole audio event, do it from audio event mode. And just know that there's one little hidden gem for stretching by putting your cursor near the edge of the waveform of the audio event anywhere, bottom, top, doesn't matter. Not the very top where you get into the fades again, right? But just somewhere near the edge. Now you can drag the whole thing in and out and it's very visual and simple. This is how you do full scale stretching without getting confused, okay? Let's put it back right on the, the line. If you're in stretch mode, the purpose of this mode is to work with stretching inside of the entire audio event inside of the clip. So think of this as the whole audio clip stretching the entire thing. This is for stretching things internally and surgically inside the clip. Okay, so let's see how that looks now. Now when you enter stretch mode, look what happens at the bottom of the clip here. We get these two little markers that are sort of like half Q markers on the ends, and there's this red line that shows up in the middle. Well, first, let's talk about that red line, because that's an interesting thing. I'm going to flip this back to raw mode for a minute, and you can see the red line disappears, and we don't even have stretch markers anymore, right? Because it knows that this clip is no longer stretched. And the audio container stayed where it was, but really the end of the audio is right about there somewhere. Um, and when we go back to stretch mode, gets those markers again, it turns red at the bottom, and now we've got this thing where, where's the marker that was over here? Well, remember, I dragged this thing around, so we have to drag it out to find where the real end of the audio event is. So let's do a couple things. Let's put this back to 110, which is where I originally dragged the clip in. Even though it's at 125, 
Now let's do this from the beginning so you can really see this. I'm gonna take this clip, it's at 125 BPM. I'm bringing it in. My project's at 110. And my option up here is set to say, when you bring in a long sample, keep it raw. Don't stretch it. So when I go to look at the properties of the audio clip, it says, I'm not really, well, first of all, I know that the original tempo is 125 because of this thing. So when you set it to elastic or any stretch mode, I'm going to instantly stretch it and lengthen it out so that under the covers here, it's really gonna expand out a full two bars. And this red mark means that it's made the sample more slow than before. Red means slower, blue means faster. So what do I mean by that? Let's go back to the audio event version of this and let's drag this in so that it's much faster than before. And if I go back to stretch, you're gonna see this line is like a turquoise color now. Now there is a way to do a full stretch if you just grab these bottom markers in stretch mode, you can do it this way, but it still can be a little confusing. But basically you'll notice the faster I make it compared to the original raw tempo of this sample, the more intense this blue line gets. And if I stretch it out, like if I make it possible to stretch it really far, the farther I stretch it out, the slower I make it, the more intense that red line gets. So this line is a way to tell at a glance when you're at close to the original tempo or slower or faster than the original raw tempo of the sample. Okay, let's undo a few times back to where we were. Okay, so that's what that line means. And the next thing to know is that uh, you place stretch markers by going along the bottom edge. And by default, whenever you get near a blue onset line, you're gonna see this little gray silhouette snap in. And if I click and drag, I'm going to both place a stretch marker at, directly on that onset and also drag it to a new position at the same time. If I undo, let's, let's try that one more time. Here's the onset marker. As I get near it, it shows up. And I could either click once to just place it and not move it, or Control Z, I could get near it, click, and then also drag to just place it and also shift it to a new grid line, okay? And again, these indicators tell me I've squeezed up this portion of the waveform now. It's faster than before. This portion is still slower than before. And then I could do the same thing here. I could come to this onset and squeeze it over this way. And now I've made this section really slow and this section really fast and this section's faster. And so, you know, you start to see the sense of these stretch lines. Let me undo both of those changes. Now here's a little bit of a gotcha. If you place a stretch marker anywhere in the waveform and then you drag the end, like even if I give myself a lot of room to work, oh, Stop that, even if I give myself a lot of room to work. My stretching now only happens between the mark I'm moving and the next mark over on the other side of the gap in between, right? I'm not stretching the full waveform anymore, okay? And the same is true if I go back to audio event mode and use this little handle. If you watch, it's only stretching from the place where the stretch mark exists inside the clip. So this is another little gotcha to be aware of. If you need to do full width stretching, full span stretching, like you're trying to align the clip visually to the grid or whatever, make sure you do that without any interior stretch marks. So if I delete this stretch mark, now the stretching is more uniform and consistent across the entire clip again, right? Or if I'm in audio event mode and I do this, Right? It's uniform again, but the minute I plop down any stretch marker anywhere, oh, I have to get in stretch mode to plop down stretch markers, right? Now it's locked to just that one stretch marker. So that's one little gotcha you'll run into. Now there's another trick about stretch markers. Sometimes what you wanna do, and let me put this back where it was, there we go, actually. 
Seems twice as long. There we go. There's the original clip. So <clears throat> let's say, for whatever reason, I want this, this hit right here to drag out longer than it does. Um, and so what I want to do is zoom in on it. And I have an onset marker here, an onset marker here, and an onset marker here. And what I want to do is stretch this thing over into this waveform, shorten up this kick, make this happen a little bit earlier, have a little more space on this side, and then this should still say, stay in the same spot. If I put in, and let's get rid of all the stretch markers, if I put a stretch marker on this onset and then drag it, I'm dragging the whole waveform across both ends, right? I'm not getting that kind of constrained result that I want. So let's undo that. Let's zoom in a little closer and let's look, look at this one more time. I'm gonna get rid of this stretch mark. And now this time, when I get the little, when I hover my mouse near the onset marker, this is a hidden gesture. This is not a gesture that this line hints at. You have to know about this, but this is a cool trick. If you get the silhouette to show up, and I haven't clicked anything yet, now I'm just going to hold down the Alt key and watch what happens. See how I get those two silhouetted stretch markers corresponding to these two onsets at the same time? Hold down Alt, and now I see those. Now watch what happens if I click and drag. It's going to automatically constrain the movement or stretching I'm doing of this one cue marker, this one stretch marker, it's going to constrain them relative to two other stretch markers that it automatically placed for me on the same side. And I mean, that's there. I've let go of my keyboard and everything, and now I can come in here and adjust it some more. So that's a handy little shortcut when you need to do something surgical, like, again, I want to move this over, but I don't want anything on this side to move or anything on this side to move. So if I come over here and put my cursor over it, hold down Alt, and then drag it, the stretching is going to be constrained in here. Okay? So that's a little useful trick to be aware of. Um, and then what else is there useful to say about this? Okay, yeah. So here's the problem with stretching and onsets that aren't really truly sitting at the transient. Some of you will be perfectionist and worry about that and want those transients to hit exactly on the grid, right? So how do you go about doing that? If I come here and um, try to put a stretch marker down right where this actual transient starts, depending on how far I'm zoomed in, I may or may not be able to do that. Like I'm zoomed in pretty far, so double clicking down here, put a stretch marker independent of the offset, and now I can drag this stretch marker over to the grid line, right? But what if I'm not zoomed in quite that far? What if I'm more like here? And I try to come and, oh, it keeps snapping to the onset marker, right? There's this kind of gravitational snap that wants to happen. And so it can be hard sometimes to get a stretch marker right on the actual waveform onset. So here's a trick. Put the stretch marker down, let the onset grab it, then jiggle that stretch marker until it's snapped to the grid line, right? Because the onset itself might not actually have been on the grid line at first. And then I want you to notice what happens to the cursor as I move from the bottom half of the line up to the top half. This is that double barbell thing that was messing us up before. One shape, a different shape. Now watch what happens. I'm going to zoom in on the waveform a little bit. If I move anywhere on the bottom half of the line or over the stretch marker itself where it's that same exact shape, it's going to move the stretch marker along the grid. And I could hold shift to keep it from snapping to grid lines so I could really precisely position it, right? Or I could let it snap to grid lines as I get close. So down here in the bottom half of the line near a stretch marker, or its line, its white line, you're going to move the entire stretch marker and the waveform that's 
end underneath to that stretch marker, right? But if I move my cursor up here so it turns into a double barbell, now if I click and drag, the stretch marker stays where it is, but the waveform shifts around it. See that? The whole waveform is shifting. Let me zoom out so you can really see that. I'm grabbing the stretch marker. The whole waveform shifts in this weird, almost logarithmic kind of way around it. Okay, you can get some really interesting behavior this way. But the main use for this, let's undo all that. The main use for this is getting your transients exactly lined up on the grid if that's something that bothers you. Like the onset snapped my, my transient marker to itself and then I put the transient marker on the grid and then I just come up here and click and slide until my actual visible transient of the waveform is right on the grid. Okay, and then I can move down the line and do that to the next one. And it's kind of like pinning sheets on a clothesline. See, here's the onset marker. It's nowhere near the, the uh, backbeat of bar two. Here's the transient. Neither of them are actually on the grid. So if I come over here and like make a, a, a stretch marker that corresponds to this onset marker, and then I stretch it over here, I've moved this, oh crap, but I can just come up here and just shift this right back and lock it right onto the grid line, right? Let's go down the line and do it again. Let's pick this one. Okay, same situation. The onset isn't on the grid line, transient's nowhere near the grid line. What can I do? Well, if I'm far enough away that I won't even like magnetically lock into the, the onset marker, I could just put my cursor on the grid line and double click and it'll snap to the grid line. And then I can just get double barbell and drag the transient over to the, to the marker, right? And you can just work your way up and down the entire waveform like this, just like saying that one looks a little off. Let me come in. Okay, let me double click to make a grid marker on, on right on the grid line, a stretch marker, and then come up here and just stretch the waveform over to it. And you can just, you know, very micro, micro adjust your entire waveform with just a few stretch markers, you know? Because a lot of times with a, with a waveform, especially a humanized performance of a drum breaks or whatever, uh, you don't care that everything is precisely on the beat. You just need to work your way down the line and at a couple strategic points where you see the, the waveform drifting off the grid, you pick like this one and you line it up with the grid again and then you go down a whole bunch more and then you pick another one and line it up with the grid again. This is the way DJs work when they're preparing their songs and their DJ software. They don't, they don't find every beat in an entire three minute song and snap that beat to the grid. They just work their way down like eight or 12 or 16 bars, grab a beat, slide it to the grid, go down another eight or 12 or 16 bars, grab a beat, slide it to the grid, and they just roughly line up the beat so that it's pretty much on grid. And you can do the same thing here. So uh, double click to create an ad hoc uh, stretch marker, but it'll always wanna snap nearby to the closest grid line. See this? See how this line turns white? If I double click here, it's gonna snap it to the grid line. Right? And then you can just come up here and say, all right, let me put that transient right on the grid line. Okay? This is a fast way to work and it doesn't require you to give a damn about these onsets. Just go down here and do a grid line and then come up here and drag the waveform over and pop that transient visibly right over the stretch marker and you're done. Okay? And if for some reason you're trying to do that, but it wants to snap to the onset, you get a visual indication of that because it's this gray silhouette thing, right? It's not a white, just a plain white line on the nearest grid line. Like if I double click here, it'll snap to the grid line. But if I double click on this side, because there's a transient hiding up here in the middle, it wants to basically make the, the snap, the marker snap to the onset. So then I can just drag the onset over or rather the marker after it's snapped. And then I can come up here and just adjust whatever I want to be over that stretch marker. And then from this point forward, that stretch marker holds on to the waveform underneath it. Again, it's like closed pins on a clothesline. And if you just play with this a little bit and just realize that you can either snap to a grid line or snap to a onset like this, right? And then you can either 
move the pin, the clothespin and the sheet that's hung on it together, or you can leave the pin where it is and adjust the sheet under the pin. That's all you need to know about stretching. I mean, that's it. Everything in a, in a handbag. And it's real easy to just walk all the way through here and quickly adjust and get anything more or less lined up to grid tempo. So that's everything you need to know about stretching. And I will see you. Oh, up, up, up. I almost forgot to talk about uh, the workaround for the Ableton way of transposing clips. So remember I showed you at the beginning of the video, I showed you this little guy. So let's talk about that. For this one, we're gonna use a kick sample, just a, a one shot. Let's find something with an obvious pitch to it and some pitch information. Uh, you're quiet. Why? There we go. Sorry about that. My headphones turned off. Okay, so that's a pitchy kick. Let's find something pitchier. Those are all pretty knocky. There we go. There's a good pitchy kick. So let's drag this kick up in here. Take a look at it. All right. So we have no idea what, what the pitch of this kick actually is, right? There's a couple ways we could find out. There's lots of ways. I'm just going to use the simple, super fast way and use uh, M tuner. This is a pretty accurate tuner for this kind of thing. Don't need this. Okay. So it seems like this is in B, right? Or a little bit sharp of B. So let's say we're working in the key of F. And I want my kick to be tuned a fifth above F so that it's a little bit higher up in the spectrum than my sub lines, which we're hitting on F, right? So I basically need to transpose this down by one semitone to make this work in the key of F, okay? From, from B to A, actually two semitones, right? B, B flat, A. So I need to drop this thing down by two semitones. And here's the thing. If I, if I bring this in and I turn this into a stretch mode like Elastic Pro, and then I say pitch it down by two semitones, I've done the job. I pitched it down. It's now a lower pitched kick. Right? Put it back up where it was. Right, put it back down. Right? It's hitting an A now, close to it. See? It's pretty much an A kick now. Um, the problem is, in some cases, for some people, the length of this sample is exactly the same as it was before. We're using a time stretching algorithm to change its pitch, which means it leaves the length of the waveform the same. And this can mess up phase and do some other things that are a little bit undesirable. It could add artifacts, because it's using a very complex algorithm that tries to keep it the same length, but change the pitch independently of the length. And so phase and all kinds of things are messed up. It's pitched in A, but these waveforms are still at a spacing or distance that is basically a B. And that's going to create problems phasing with my subs, that might hit at the same time as this and all kinds of stuff, right? If I have a sub in A and this kick tuned to A, the problem is these waveforms are kind of still looking like a B and I can't really tell where the waveforms start now and it just gets a little weird, right? So over in Ableton land, producers who routinely do this kind of quick and dirty transposing, they use this knob, they don't warp it, and therefore, it's working exactly the same way as if, and I'm gonna undo the pitch changes here. Oh, this way. Okay, I'm gonna set it back to raw. And it's as if, well, I can't, I can't change its, uh, its tempo when it's raw. So I'm gonna set it back to repitch, right? 
which is the tape machine style of repitching in Bitwig. If I push the tempo up, see how the, the waveform expands out and the pitch goes down? And if I make the tempo slower, it pulls it in and the pitch goes up and the waveform gets closer and closer together. We're seeing the actual frequency of this subby kick waveform change. Waves, waves are longer apart, farther apart, that means lower in pitch. Closer together, that means higher in pitch. And now we're adjusting the pitch in a way that is doesn't change the phase in an undesirable way. It's actually changing the phase of the waveform to match like other sounds that might be running at the same pitch, right? Like a sub. So here's the dilemma. And this is a complaint I see from people who are trying out Bitwig. They're Ableton users and they're trying out Bitwig. And one of the first things they complain about is, wait a minute, where is this fucking knob? I just want to change the pitch and I need it to change it like a tape machine. I need it to change it by stretching out the waveform. I just want to transpose it up or down an octave or two, but when I put it in repitch mode, which is the one and only warping mode that alters pitch and time together like a tape player, it's the only one that does that. The problem is, for whatever stupid reason, repitch mode only allows you to change the tempo, not the semitones, it's grayed out. These don't have any effect. And it's a legitimate complaint. If any Bitwig devs are reading this, watching this, you really got to fix this. You got to give us something like this for use when we are in, sorry, for use when we are in um, repitch mode. Okay, so ranting and agreeing aside, let me show you how to work around this now, because it is a fairly simple workaround. All this, all this repitch knob is, this transpose knob is doing is changing the pitch, uh, changing the tempo of the waveform under the covers. And by changing the tempo, it's changing the pitch, right? But it's just doing some math for you under the covers. And this is why it would be dirt easy for the Bitwig devs to do the same exact thing, right? So until, if and until, if and when, Bitwig actually gives us pitch control when you're in repitch mode. Until that time, here's the workaround. You just got to do a little math. The math is not obvious, but some bright people in the Bitwig group pointed out the math, and then I went and built a device based on the math. So here's what we're looking for. I'm going to use a preset, and I'm going to share this preset with you. I'm just going to search for calculator. And so I've built a grid device called Repitch Calculator. And uh, oops, let's go back over here and get into device mode. Get rid of the tuner. So if I drag my Repitch Calculator into this track, what this is, is an FX grid device, okay? And audio input, audio output, nothing on the signal line between the input and output. This is just being used for some math calculation, okay? And even further, the mix knob on this entire device is turned all the way to the left, which means absolutely nothing happening inside this device is affecting the sound. It's neutral. Whatever sound comes into this channel and runs through this device runs through completely unchanged by this device. So my point is, when you, when you grab this preset from me, and I'll put a link in the download description of the video. When you drag this thing in, save it to your library, and every time you drag it in, you can just ignore it. You can leave it sitting in your device chain if you want. You're just going to use it for these calculator area here. It's completely neutral. So here's how you use it. Uh, you have to, and what I'm going to do is pop this off into its own window so we can see two things at once. Um, for the original event, the original kick. Let's, uh, let's bring it back in again so that we're not really super confused. Uh, excellent mid temps, XL. Because I switched this calculator. Oh, there's a space in there. Mid temps, okay. This is kick 38. 
All right, it's this kick right here. So let's bring this in again from scratch. Um, bring it in, drop it on the 2.1 line. So remember, when we brought this in and tested it, we saw that it was in the pitch of B. It was tuned to B. So we need to drop it down two semitones to get it to A. And we can only do that by setting this to repitch mode. And oops, I can't just do negative two by clicking this button twice. So I have to figure out what new tempo will actually truly drop this down by two semitones and make the waveform correspondingly longer because we're dropping it in pitch so the waveform is going to push out longer. And that'll keep the phase where we need it to be. So that's where this calculator comes in. All you got to do is come over here and say, what's the original raw BPM of this tempo? Now, this particular kick, we don't necessarily know that answer. Okay, we don't know what the original raw tempo is, but what we do know is that at a tempo of 110, which is where I brought it in at, raw, at 110, it's a pitch of B. So we're going to pretend our original tempo is one, God damn it! I'll hover over that and change it to 110, right? So I'm at 110, and we tuned it and checked the tuning, and it was a B. And now I need to drop it down by two semitones to an A. So I change this value by dragging on it to negative 2. And then just here's the math to actually do the calculation. If I set the tempo to be 123.47, this will become exactly two semitones lower in pitch, and it will push out to this new length. So watch, if I come over here and I do 123.47 and hit enter, watch what happens up in the purple waveform. It got a little bit longer and it is now higher in pitch. I'm sorry, lower in pitch. And we can even test that uh, by bringing in M tuner again. And let's close this window, the big window. And if I play this, it should say A. Okay, it's a little bit lower than A. So I went a tiny bit too far. So again, you could just sit here and adjust it until you get it tuned right. We're really close. Let's just take the sense down a little bit. Let's take it down to like there. Okay, it's closer. Oops, I'm actually making it closer to G-sharp, so let's push it out a little longer the other direction. Let's keep going. Getting there. Let's go up one. Oh, come on. Now we're, oh, see, I am making it lower. I want to go this way. All right. Try it out there. Yeah, I need to go down. Keep going down. It's back at B. See, it's going to be a really fine amount once we're in the ballpark. Even one tempo, one BPM can be too much. And we're getting closer. One more BPM. Getting closer. Now we're a little go this direction. All right, so for whatever reason, when it gets out here, it's um between this transient drop where the where the Pitch is faster. You can see these are closer together. This is just a hard kick to tune. This tuner may not be super accurate for this one. Theoretically, if, um, if we follow the advice here and just make it 123.47, it should really be two semitones down. 123.47. 
and it's just the, the pitch drop in the in the big long body of this kick. That's what's confusing the tuners. But technically, it's two semitones lower than what we originally measured it at, and we can hear that difference. So, one twenty three dot forty seven. Let's listen to this. Now let's put it back at 110. See how that's higher in pitch? Let's, let's make it more obvious. Let's go down seven semitones. So 164.81. So here's the original pitch. And 164.81. See, now it's higher by exactly seven. Um, oh, it went up. Did I get this wrong? This might need to be a positive 12. Sorry. Let's try 73. Yeah, that's seven semitones higher. Sorry, I had this uh, backwards. That'll be fixed when you get the upload. So here's seven semitones higher than the original. No, see that is, I wanted to go lower, but that's making it higher. It should be negative 12, my bad. The person who gave me this formula said positive 12, but I found that wasn't correct. So if we push this up to 164, yeah, see that's lower, lower by seven semitones. And if I put it back at 110, see that's higher, lower, higher. Uh, so then if we wanted to go in the other direction, for example, if I wanted to go up by a full five semitones, I make that positive five, 82.4, So that's definitely higher than 110. Control undo. Okay. So the point is, yes, they should give us semitone control, but they don't. So just use this calculator. It will absolutely be correct by the time you download it. I'll double check this a few more times and make sure the math is correct, but it was really just, this was off originally. Um, so that's pretty much your, your trick. And then of course, if you're bringing in a sample where it does know the original beat, like let's go, let's go stop that. Let's go to a loop of some sort. Now let's use a, per, uh, 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 a bass loop. Something with some pitch to it. All right, so here's something, let's see, I want something close to 110. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll use 140. Oh, you're not going to do that, huh? Okay. Oh, it's because I, damn it. <laughs> I flipped over here. Let's try that again. Uh, 120. I fat fingered it. So, yeah, let's use this one in C. Okay, we got a bass loop in C at a tempo of 120. Let's get rid of this. Bring this over. Okay, so here it is at its original tempo, its raw tempo. Hopefully it's not too loud. Oh, it's a boring one. Let's find a better one. That's a little better. It's got 
got some pitch changes to it. Okay. So it's an F sharp, it's at 120. So if we flip it to repitch mode, and we set its original tempo to 120, it's going to take that original one and slow it down to 110. But because we're in a warping mode, it sounds the same as before. We've said it's originally 120, we want you to play it back at 110, but we want you to re-pitch it. So it kept the pitch the same as before, but length, uh, shortened or lengthened the clip. Let's see what happens if we flip it back to raw. Yeah, see how the clip gets shorter? So it made the clip longer, so that at this tempo it would play back at the same pitch, but it had to make it longer to do that. Right, that's the essence of repitch mode. So, we've got it still at its original pitch of F sharp. Now let's say we want to pitch it up to um, F sharp G, G sharp A. We're going to go up four semitones to A, right? So, we know that the original pitch of the loop at F sharp is 120, right? So we're going to set this to 120, hold down all, uh, control click one two oh enter and then we want to go up four semitones to a so if we set the if we fake it out and say no 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 your original pitch wasn't really 120 we're going to tell you that the original pitch was 95.244 and that's going to transpose us up exactly four semitones to a let's check it out 95.244 Let's undo that. Let's redo it. That doesn't sound so good because four semitones down, well, anyway. Um, point being, if you need to do semitone pitch changes, the Ableton way, this is your only option. Do the math. And you can figure out what this math means, but it's basically taking uh, the original tempo, and then you're saying how far do you want to transpose it, and you're dividing the distance you want to transpose it by negative 12, and then you're feeding that into a power, uh, co power calculation that's basically saying take two and raise it to the power of whatever this four divided by negative 12 was. And then you're going to multiply that result by the original tempo. See, it's this weird math, but it works. And so I just built this calculator for you. What's the original tempo? How far do you want to shift it? Let's take it up just, let's take it down one semitone. So if we set it now to 127.14. We've just shifted it down exactly one semitone. Put it back at uh, 120. Undo, one semitone down. Right, you can hear that. That sounds good because it's not too big of a stretch. Um, so there you go. That's everything you need to know about stretching, including the tricky thing, which is how the hell to emulate this. I want to put a big shout out to a uh, Discord server member named Robert, who I think posted that particular formula in a way that I could understand and then build this. So this isn't me. I didn't think this up. I stand on the shoulders of other people. <laughs> And uh, I just made a, a handy dandy little calculator that I could use. Um, and I'm sharing it with y'all and sharing the technique with y'all. So that's it. Maybe someday Bitwig will give us some love and just let us directly set the pitch on repitch mode. All right, see you for the next one. Uh, in the next video, we're gonna talk about layered editing and then we'll finally get to the final capstone, which is talking about how to work with acapellas, because that's the hardest thing to work with in audio editing.